Perfect. I think we are live. Looks like uh, it. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, a big welcome to our five hours of YouTube marketing and SEO webinar, which is brought to you by SEM Rush. And I am delighted to be one of the hosts today. Um, my name is Bengu Atamer, and I'm the co-founder of Buzz My Videos. Buzz My Videos is a company that's focusing on all things YouTube. I'm an ex-YouTube employee myself, uh, and what we do, we kind of like help brands, publishers, content creators with their YouTube journey from content strategy to content optimization. Uh, and while we do that, we actually use our own technology, which helps us optimize content at scale. And today, uh, it's going to be a long journey. It's going to be five hours. Uh, I'm just going to walk you through the different sessions, uh, but before, Please do let us know where you're joining from. Uh, hi from Colombia, perfect, morning. Uh, Pune, India, great. Uh, we are all based in uh, England right now. Uh, and uh, the first two sessions are going to be hosted by me. But then later on, I'm going to be joined by Luke Sheeran, who is going to take it over from me. And also, I will be presenting myself as well. Uh, let me walk you through the, the different sessions. There are going to be six different sessions throughout five hours. I will be speaking a lot. And uh, the first session, we will start with content strategy because content is king. Content is based for everything on YouTube. And Yellen, uh, who is joining me today, is going to be presenting you 10 commandments of content strategy on YouTube. And then later on, I'm going to be joined by my co-founder, Paula. She is going to be running and hosting a panel, joined by brands, publishers, and great content creators, telling you some best practices and tips of, of success on YouTube. And also later on, we will have a guest from Google, uh, Kamil Tavas, who's going to be walking us through different ad types. So we will be slightly kind of touching base on uh, advertising on YouTube for SMBs. And then later on, I'm going to hand it over to Luke Sheeran. I will be presenting live streaming best practices myself because live streaming has become a huge, uh, important uh, content format on YouTube itself. And then the last two sessions are going to be really, really interesting. One of them is going to be handled by Chase Rayner, who is going to be focusing on YouTube SEO and growing your channel from zero to 38,000 subscribers. And then the last one is going to be run by Rob Balasabas, who is going to actually talk you through how to get your first 1,000 subscribers, which is a huge milestone, actually a very important milestone on YouTube because it would make you a YouTube partner and you can monetize your content potentially. And also, I will, I'm, jo I'm joined by some great knowledgeable panelists as well uh, today. Please, if you have any questions, we want these sessions to be as interactive as possible. Please do raise them in the Google, in the, in the YouTube chat. And if we can't answer them, please use the hashtag uh, five hours of YouTube and raise it on Twitter to, different, uh, to the different panelists and speakers. Maybe I can just like start by introducing my guests, Yalin and Nikki. Yalin um, is actually an ex-YouTube employee as well. Although we've never worked together, we've been sitting on the different sides of the table. And uh, I've had the privilege to listen to some of his great uh, presentations over the years. And to be honest with you, I can't think of anyone else who can speak of uh, creating a great narrative, making it interactive and engaging and building a content strategy. So I am so pleased that he will be presenting this session. I can't wait because I will be learning a lot. And then also I am joined by uh, Nikki Wicks, who is actually uh, head of content strategy and innovation for Joe Wicks, uh, the body coach channel, which has become a national phenomenon here in the UK. And they have been uh, keeping us lean for the last 18 weeks. So huge thanks for that. Um, with that, I'm just going to pass it over to you so you can introduce yourselves. And then Yellen, you can take it over and start your presentation. Sounds great. Maybe, Nikki, we start with you. And then um, I can then introduce myself and then go into the presentation side of things. 
Okay. Yes. Thank you, Bengu. That was a, a lovely introduction. Um, so yeah, I'm Nikki. Um, I'm um, head of content at the Body Coach, and um, yeah, I, I I know Yalin very well. Actually, um, he was very very instrumental in the uh, start of our uh, YouTube journey as a as a business. So it's nice to see you again, Yalin, and hopefully we can talk a bit about um, take a little bit of a trip down memory lane because it's where it all started, really. Likewise, likewise. Um, and I am Yalin, and I am uh, co-founder of NaviVest, uh, which is a digital mindset consultancy based in London for growth capital and venture capital. But as Ben, you mentioned, prior to co-founding NaviVest, um, I actually worked at YouTube for six and a half years and always within the creator partnerships team. Uh, my last role there was uh, head of public figure partnerships for Europe, Middle East, and Africa. So I lived and breathed content strategy my whole time at YouTube. And with that, I'm going to share my screen and we're going to go into a little bit of a presentation format first, because there's a couple of things that I want to impart to the audience, uh, but then we're going to go quickly to uh, the practical side of the presentation with Nikki. And as Nikki mentioned, we worked together um, for a long time um, at the very beginning of their YouTube journey. Uh, and that's also why I wanted to invite Nikki because we thought we could have a great conversation around how you can come up with uh, your content strategy on, on YouTube. So I'm going to share my screen. And Bengu, can you guys see this? Yes. Yes, we can see. perfect, Thanks. perfect, wonderful. Great, okay, well, we decided to, so first of all, I should say that I'm very happy to be here. So thank you for inviting me and, um, we wanted to call the session, it all starts with content because when Bengu and SEM Rush uh, approached me for the session, um, you know, we thought that we would wanna start there because without a great content strategy, any optimizations that you do on your YouTube channel is not necessarily meaningful. So it all really has to start with content. So the agenda today of what I want to go through with you today um, is focus on first the storytelling side of things, because really good content is anchored on great storytelling, uh, which a lot of brands actually tend to forget where cre for creators, it's really innate to what they do on YouTube. So we're going to first talk about tennis of storytelling. Uh, and then we're going to move on to how you can ensure a purposeful content strategy with a hero hub help approach. And then once we have that down, then we're going into then we're going to go into the more the what we call the Ten Commandments of YouTube, which is to really ensure that your content strategy is optimized. It's essentially a way for you to whittle down any ideas that you've come up with for your content to make sure that it works for you. Um, and finally, we'll have the panel with Nikki. So first and foremost, I want to take a quick sidestep and kind of show the marketing trifecta. For those of you who are in marketing, this is not going to be anything new, but when people think of YouTube marketing, they really only think about the paid media side of things, which is, it's, it's, it's true that it's a big piece of your marketing efforts. It's the advertising that you can do on YouTube, but actually there's, uh, as a marketing team, and when you're marketing your brand, it's actually a trifecta that you really need to think about. So besides the paid media, you have earned media, which comes really from mentions, shares, reposts and reviews. Uh, this is essentially marketing that you earn through your user base uh, and through the services that you provide. They're happy to share and repost and do your work for you, essentially. Um, and finally, uh, last but not, but not least, is your owned media. And this includes your website, your social media channels. And this is where your YouTube channel would fit uh, straight in here, square in the middle. Um, and today, in this session specifically, we're going to be focusing on the owned media side of things. So let's move on to tenets of storytelling. So when I um, wanted to go into this, I wanted to show a quick example of what I mean by this. So I'll give you a print example. So we'll go back to, we'll do a little history lesson. We'll go back to 1983, January, which I'm guessing, you know, since this is the YouTube audience that many of you were probably just born about then, but this is essentially um, the Apple Lisa computer uh, advertising spread that Steve Jobs and the team at Apple had put together uh, in the New York Times. And this is a nine page spread. And as you can see, it literally shows you how you can use the computer. The last page, the ninth page is essentially where you can buy it. So it has a list and addresses of the, of the dealers that you can do. Um, I normally, in a, in a live audience, I would ask, how many computers do you guys think they sold? With the strategy, they only sold about 10,000 Lisa computers, which is not that great. And actually, uh, Steve Jobs leaves Apple um, after this. Um, it's all geek speak. It's not really a great marketing move. 
Then let's uh, fast forward 14 years. Steve Jobs returns to Apple, and in his first campaign back, this is the first campaign that he releases across billboards in the US. And there's a dramatic difference between what you saw before and what you see now on your screens. Essentially, what he does here is there's no product, there's no service. He basically shows these amazing people and what they've accomplished. And there's a, uh, there's a tagline called think different. So essentially the message here is, if you want to think different, like these revolutionaries, like these you know innovative people, you can do that through Apple. And they've used this campaign for over five years um, and it is credited for turning Apple's fortunes around. The reason I start there is really because people don't buy the best product and they buy the best story. This isn't only true for video content, it has always been true. So that's also why I wanted to show you a print example um, from history. And the best story gets you customer loyalty and pipeline because you really have to build an emotional connection and a community around your brand. So the three tenets of storytelling, at least for me, they're all built upon these three values. The first is purpose. Um, the content that you produce has to be purposeful. It cannot be just to get uh, popular or to go viral. It really has to serve a purpose. The second is it has to be authentic. So authenticity is super key, um, especially on YouTube. It's, it's key in all of social media, but it's especially true on YouTube because of the level of engagement that you get uh, on the platform. And people, especially YouTube viewers, are very, very adept. After so many years of watching YouTube, they can sniff inauthenticity from a mile away. And finally, empathy, because Empathy is how you really connect with people. It's not sympathy. And actually, I wish I could show you this video, but I'm not going to show you now um, because you can find this on YouTube. But after the sessions that you'd like to watch, after uh, that you'd like to watch, just go to YouTube and search for Brenna Brown on empathy. And it's a three-minute video. It's probably the best three-minute video that I've ever seen talking about empathy and how it's different to sympathy. Highly, highly worth watching. So with those three values out of the way, because they're really like the crux and the core of how you approach your YouTube channel, let's talk about the purposeful side of things. The Hero Hub Help approach is developed so that you can provide, um, you can essentially take your content category and figure out what to expect from each of your videos. So when you're thinking of your content category, uh, usually what brands will do is they'll just talk about their product. They'll just create videos about uh, about their product, which really doesn't work, especially on YouTube, because it's seen as blatant advertising. So instead, what I recommend you do is you look at your values, not just your product. So look at the inspiration behind the brand, behind the company, behind the product. Look at your mission. Look at what you're trying to advocate for. And then see where you're overlapping with your audience peers passions, goals, idols, and communities. What this really allows you to do is, while you will have a core content territory that's defined by your product and service, there is lots of space around that that's really what we call the adjacent content territory. I'll come into this a little bit later when I'm showing a couple of brand examples that really uh, live on that map. But this is a great place to start for how you can widen your content territory so you don't, you don't feel so constrained by what you can do. And then you can really apply the Hero Hub Help strategy to really whittle down how to approach and what to expect from each of your videos. So what I've tried to do here is normally uh, you look at a customer funnel. Um, when you look at a customer funnel, it's really just the one you know, inverted uh, pyramid. But in YouTube, it's not necessarily just the pyramid. That's why I kind of came up with this visual of an hourglass that is kind of turned on it sideways, because there's really two entry points into your channel on YouTube. On the left side, people come to YouTube to browse, right? These are the users that come to youtube.com and they seek inspiring new content. These are the people that leverage the algorithm the most. And this is where you want to create videos that will be featured. So, and so you want to create inspiring new content for these kinds of users, not necessarily um, targeted to your product. And this is what, what you're trying to do with the hero content is raise broad awareness because you're trying to, you're, you're essentially um, accessing a very mainstream audience via the browsers and support major brand moments. On the right side of the funnel, which is another entry point into YouTube, is searching. YouTube is actually the second biggest search engine after Google, and it still is. Um, and this is where users seek relevant content. They will come in and search for how to's, et cetera. And to get viewership from that user funnel, you want to create what we call help videos. These are the ones that you do. This is essentially pull content 
and you're trying to get discovered with always on, what's sometimes also referred to as evergreen content. But searching can also mean you want to, searching can also mean that you do uh, videos for trending topics as well, if you're especially quick to respond to that trend. But ideally, what you're trying to do is you're trying to funnel these two entry points into your channel. You're trying to get them to watch other videos on your channel, which are, which are the videos that we call your hub videos. And this is what people actually then subscribe to your channel for. So the two sides, the hero and the help, is really how you try to get discovered by different uh, user behaviors on the platform. And then you try to get people to subscribe to your channel with the hub content. And this is where you really want to create regularly scheduled push content that so your subscribers can enjoy. I'll give you guys a, a couple of examples on this. But before I do, I want to quickly give you an expectation of how this really plays out in the timeline of a channel when you look at viewership. So if you have on the x-axis time and the y-axis, you have um, uh, viewership. Really, the help videos are there and generating constant uh, viewership for your channel. They're, they tend to be evergreen, um, but they're not really the ones that are getting the most viewership. Then the hub series and formats, behind the scenes, collaborations, this type of hub content then drives the channel because the more uh, viewers that you convert to subscribers, the more than they're willing to engage with the existing content, the hub content on the channel, driving majority of the viewership. And then the hero content that you do once in a while, this normally, this normally happens, let's say, twice a year or up to four times a year because these are the things that you do that go above and beyond what you normally would do from a budget perspective, from a narrative perspective, et cetera. So for you, to help you visualize this, um, I took uh, the BMW channel as an example. So if you look at their hero content, um, and these are actually linked, I believe the PDF of the presentation is available. So if you click through the PDF, you'll be able to watch these videos. Um, their hero videos are really small, um, I would say, films. So the one that I've highlighted here uh, is called The Small Escape. It goes into BMW's roots and history in Germany, where a BMW was actually utilized to smuggle people from East Berlin to West Berlin. It's a very emotional story. It's a very, very short story, but you're trying, essentially, it's BMW's attempt at, at attaching themselves to a very uh, significant piece in history. And this video has driven 2.22.5 million views in six months, as they would have expected, right? Because it appeals to a really wide audience, not just car fanatics. Then if you look at the Hub video side, on their uh, channel, they now do this regular series called BMW Today. This is where you get behind the scenes access with BMW staff into the factories, the design labs, and how BMW is actually produced. And for a car fan, this is, this is essentially heaven, right? So compared to the small escape, it doesn't drive as, many, as much viewership, but still 28,000 views in six days is quite significant for a brand to engage their subscriber base, their core fanatics, the car fanatics essentially, which is their target audience. And then finally, their help videos, which is what they're trying to educate with, is their how-tos. So they have this BMW how-to series, and this is essentially uh, highlighting features and functionalities of the, of the newest cars that they have and how they can use this example. This example is how to use the new assisted uh, driving view, which has driven 250,000 views in four months. So as hopefully this is a great, hopefully this is a good example for you to uh, bring to mind how you can approach and the kind of examples that really sit in each of these uh, video buckets. But to give you an example to go beyond BMW, because BMW's approach to YouTube is quite specific, um, it's worthwhile looking at this map. So what you see here is essentially a content strategy uh, territory, let's say. And you, we, I've kind of really placed brands based on how they approach their strategy in terms of either they are on the y-axis, they're either targeting core interest at the bottom, or they're really leaning into adjacent interest at the top. Um, and on the x-axis, I really try to qualify them based on whether or not they're self-creating content, meaning they're the only ones creating content on their own, versus on the other extreme, collaborative creation, which is where the brand actually doesn't create their content, they actually leverage content created by user users, so UGC. So in this map, you can see several different approaches. These are all, in my opinion, very, very good, very, very good YouTube channels to really aspire to. Uh, a couple of examples that I'll highlight. On the collaborative side of things, you've got GoPro and Red Bull. Um, these guys do their own content, but they heavily leverage user-generated content, and GoPro really goes into adjacent interest as much as possible 
unlike Red Bull, Red Bull is more defined as an extreme sports destination, which is more of a core interest um, approach. Um, and when you look at Lego, for instance, I think they're kind of smack in the middle um, because they do a lot of content that's animated, um, that leverages the Lego um, approach. They do a lot of narrative storytelling. Um, they don't do as much collaborative creation uh, on their channel. Disney is a great example. What I really liked what they did during the pandemic was they did a whole series of storytelling. Um, so story time essentially uh, with the people, the voices behind the most loved characters, uh, the most loved Disney characters, which is a brilliant way to engage an audience in a very low cost way uh, without a ton of production. So hopefully this gives you a good idea of the map of, um, of content territory and how each of these different companies approach to their the hero hub help strategy to define purposeful content and finally in the last section of my presentation i'm going to focus more on the 10 commandments of youtube so i'm assuming that up until this point you've defined as a brand what your values are uh your so your purpose your authenticity uh, and your empathy points, you've defined those for your storytelling in general, then you moved on and decided what your hero approaches could be given your brand and the sector that you're in, your hub approaches could be, and your help approaches could be. And this is the step where you normally as a team will come together and you'll brainstorm different ideas. Um, usually the, the creators and brands that, we've, that I've worked with at YouTube do this at least a monthly uh, update. Um, and then what they try to do is they go through these 10 commandments of YouTube to whistle down the list, and then they try to allocate them to one of these buckets of hero, help, or hub. When I look at all these 10, so this is, this is how I've laid out the 10, um, I've added another layer on top um, just because I believe that certain things are foundational in my, in my opinion. So inspiration, sustainability, and consistency are key to getting a great um, YouTube presence. I call these the foundation uh, commandments. Then the next bucket is how do you get viewers? So getting viewer um, uh, commandments. These are targeting, discoverability, accessibility, and shareability. And then finally, the engage and build community. This is where conversation, interactivity, and collaboration kind of comes in. And as you'll see, collaboration is a darker color because I believe collaboration is something that everyone should um, kind of strive to get at, but it's usually the hardest to get right. Um, and you kind of get, in my opinion, you get bonus points for getting that right on top of all of these. So if I go into each of these, what I thought might be helpful is actually to give you a couple of, um, questions and triggers that you can use in your brainstorming sessions to really consider ideas, whether or not they are um, good enough to include. So inspiration, the, really, the, the question to ask here is really, are we passionate about this topic or are we just trying to be popular? This goes to the authenticity side of things a little bit. It's a very, very crucial uh, question to ask when you're planning your content, because if, if you're not passionate about it, it will come across very, very easily and your viewership will, will understand very easily. Um, secondly, sustainability. The question here that I came up with uh, for you to use is, can we create this easily? Can we block shoot? Is this way above our ability? Because one of the mistakes that a lot of brands will uh, think about YouTube creation is that you need to have a lot of equipment, you need to have a lot of production capability to do a lot of this stuff, which you really don't. Um, because if you look at YouTube creators, they do this with very minimal uh, equipment. And as you will hear from Nikki as well later on, um, all of their content, you know, Joe sometimes shoots his own content. It's usually on a DSLR with an external mic and really nothing else, maybe some lights. So it's, it really doesn't take a lot of um, equipment to shoot. So make sure that whatever you're coming up with for your idea doesn't require a ton of equipment, a ton of production. Um, this also gets into a little bit of looking into formats um, because if you can block shoot something, you can get into the studio, you can shoot three, four videos in one go, and then it's just up to the editing team to edit and then essentially schedule them out. It just saves so much time and so much stress from your life if you can block shoot. So this is a question that you should be asking as a foundation because the last thing you want is to start a YouTube channel and you know tell people that you'll be uploading weekly which, is, which would be advised, but then not be able to follow up with it, uh, which really is not great for subscriber engagement. And the last one in foundation is consistency. Um, this is where we would look for recurring elements. And this recurring elements doesn't have to be a personality, although it could be, uh, but it could also be a format. It could be an upload schedule. Uh, there's lots of examples of this. Uh, the example that I always give, there's, I mean, there's a couple, but the one that always comes out of people's minds and everybody knows is Carpool Karaoke. This is a format. 
Uh, the 73 questions with Vogue is a format, the personality in it changes all the time, but there's a consistency to the user because if they've liked one of them before, even though some of the other elements change, they have an innate um, expectation of what it might be. So they're more likely to click onto that video because they've enjoyed a previous version. So definitely make sure you have some recurring elements. Now, when we look at getting viewers, the first thing to really look at is targeting. Um, and the questions here are, are we attracting the right viewers? And are we only focusing on our core fans or are we also targeting adjacent viewers? This is what I was mentioning before with the content territory. And I think it's really, really important uh, to be able to appeal to a mass, to a wider audience and to a potential customer base. I highly recommend you explore adjacent viewership and adjacent interests. And based on that, you can come up with content ideas and say, actually, this idea does not fit either core fans or adjacent viewers. Let's chuck this in the bin. Next one is discoverability. So the question here to ask is, are we optimized for search? And are we tapping into trending or evergreen topics? Um, this is where a lot of the optimizations will come into play, like titles, custom thumbnails, tags, et cetera. Um, and really looking into whether or not something is trending that you could potentially have a voice on. And the, and the key with uh, responding to trending is to make sure that you respond as soon as possible, because in the internet, things will trend and then they will quickly fade. So you want to make sure that you catch the wave while the wave is at its highest point. Accessibility is our third uh, question to ask. Um, this is quite key, actually, because I, you know, I talk about formats. I talk about you know doing episodic content, which really, really works. But these videos need to stand on their own. They need to be accessible. So if somebody hasn't seen episode one of the BMW today, they should be able to see episode five and be able to enjoy it without having seen any of the previous ones. But seeing episode five gives them a clue that there is more of this stuff. And if they've enjoyed it, they will go back and watch some of the other ones. So that's why we say episodic content works really well and formats work really well. Um, but the two things that you can do here is make sure that videos can stand on their own. They're accessible and understandable on their own. Um, and then you proactively point to your other videos. So if you have a format, if you have a se uh, episodic content, make sure that at the end you use features uh, within YouTube like end cards or info cards to point people to your other videos within the same strain to build affinity for the audience. And finally, shareability. And really the question here is, would you share it actually? Like that is the main question. But uh, you could ask yourself, is our content topical, relatable, and or valuable? Because when you look at when people share things and the scenarios in which people share, it's really because they want to be the first ones to share something. They want to be proud of the fact that they found something funny, topical, relatable, valuable, you name it. So you, you, want, you want to make sure that you are at least one of those things. The idea has one of those premises in it to be shareable. And finally, engage and build community. Um, these are very, very important. Conversation is very important um, because YouTube is a two-way platform. Um, I might be preaching to the choir here a little bit because you you're you're obviously know the power of YouTube. That's why you're on this webinar. But a lot of people will mistake it and still won't talk directly to camera. So really, if you if you have speakers on in the video, make sure you're talking to camera and you're not doing the whole TV trick of you know, looking sideways. Um, and make sure you're addressing your audience directly. You're talking directly to them. Uh, make sure you use you. Um, so it's these little things that sound really common sense that a lot of people fail at. And it really helps to have a conversational aspect to your YouTube channel. Second is interactivity. So when you have the conversational aspect uh, kind of really innately inherent to your, your, to your channel, um, then the next one is try to make it as interactive as possible. Is there ways that you can involve your audience in the channel? And this could be as simple as doing polls in the community tab, or it could be things like allowing users to submit ideas, asking them at the end of a video to comment. Really, like if you've watched any YouTuber, um, uh, you will see best practices of this really, really easily. They will ask for uh, what to, you know, what their next video should be or what they should cover. Um, an example of this um, that I really, really love from a brand perspective is how Alexa Chung um, did um, essentially a live stream where she did some drawings and the drawings were submissions from the audience. So the, you know, the audience said, you know, draw a moon, draw a sun or whatever it might be. And she was drawing them in, in the live stream. And they not only included that kind of interactivity, but then they actually produced these designs, asked their audience on 
uh, you know, which design was their favorite in a poll. And they said that the top three, or I believe, I think it was the top three of the top five uh, favorite designs would be turned into limited t-shirts, which they sold on their website. So it's a brilliant, brilliant way to, in, to involve your audience in an interactive way from idea generation all the way to sales. And finally, collaboration. This is, like I said, this is the gold star of YouTube. And really, you will be looking at different creators and brands that you can engage with. Um, but really, the question to ask here, is this creator or brand the right fit for my audience or topic? Uh, they will be asking the same question. There has to be an inherent overlap between the two. And make sure you always do two videos, one for your channel and one for their channel. So you can do audience uh, transfer essentially. So both these channel, both these uh, videos will be different. Um, and usually the channel that's hosting will shoot the video um, that they're going to upload essentially. Um, but it's a way to, it's a great way to um, increase your YouTube audience because of the fact that even though YouTube has uh, an extremely large audience, um, it's, it's over 1.7 billion, um, it's also a bit of a microcosm. So if you're new to YouTube and if you're starting out at YouTube new, it really does help to collaborate with existing uh, YouTube creators uh, and brands to really tap into their audience. So like I said, use these 10 commandments as a way to filter down your ideas. These 10 commandments don't exist in the, se in the sense that every single idea that you come up with has to adhere to all of them because that's really hard to do. Um, just use these as a guideline to make sure that they pass at least a couple of these uh, for you to put them in the hero hub help buckets. And then what I recommend you do is that you do a planning session monthly, and then you essentially pull some ideas uh, from the hero hub help buckets. Um, usually what you'll do um, is upload weekly. So what you might wanna do is three videos, let's say that are distributed across the hub and the help. And then let's say if that month is a month where you want to do a hero video, then you do that, the, that one last video as your hero video. But like I said, hero videos won't come in that quickly or that often. Uh, you will only really do these two to four times a year. The rest will be mainly uh, around your hub and um, your help content. So that is the presentation side of things. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that we can go into the practical side of the discussion with Nikki. Um, hopefully I didn't talk too fast, Bengu. I don't know if that was okay. <laughs> I tend to talk very fast, so. I, I'm a fast talker as well. So <laughs> I, I did enjoy your page and I really enjoyed your presentation. So did I think everybody from what I can see from the live chat and the feedback, everybody else really enjoyed it as well. So thank you so much. Uh, Wonderful. Again, I was right. It's, it was like really insightful. Um, with that, I think you, you have a couple of comments. So I'll leave you say your comments, and then we can switch on to, to some of the questions and potentially also switch on to uh, discussing a little bit of the success of the Body Coach TV. Sounds good. Thank you, Bengu, because I, like uh, Nikki said earlier, um, Nikki and I were working, uh, when I was working at YouTube, you know, Nikki and I were working together to make sure that the Body Coach was launching a YouTube channel. Uh, so I've really watched them grow and expand and really do this as a in a masterful way. This is why I thought Nikki is the best place for the um, best place for this panel. And uh, most recently, for those of you uh, who are in the UK or actually globally, if you did PE with Joe during the pandemic, you will know the amazing things that these guys have done. So I wanted to congratulate them because actually yesterday was the last session and um, they did, uh, I wanna get this right, so I'm looking at my notes. They did 78 workouts, 80 million views across all of these, and they've raised 580,000 pounds for the NHS charities. Um, I think it deserves a round of applause. You guys have done an amazing job. Mm -hmm. Like talk about building a community. Um, so I just wanted to say that before we move on to the, the questions for Nikki and I. Thank you, Yannin. Thank you very much. Yeah, I can't claim it was 78 workouts. I, I can't claim to have done any of them um, <laughs> myself, but there was a reason because I was actually um, on the Joe's headphones for at every workout doing the shout out. So I was reading all the comments coming in and had people all over the world. So yeah, we're, uh, it's been a long, long journey, but i um, really proud of, of, of all the work and how, and how well it was received. So thank you. Of course. 
Thank you so much. Exactly as Yolan said, it was, I think, phenomenal. And especially the timing was so so appropriate that it, it uplifted everybody's mood and as, as a nation, I, I guess. So thank you so much. It was an awesome effort. Um, um, so with that, Yolan, there are a few questions specifically uh, for, for your session and then... Sure. Um, and then we can move on to some of the some of the secret sauce and the strategy of of the Body Coach TV. Uh, so speaking of uh, you know how you were describing uh, content, uh, some audience coming in and uh, searching for content, whereas some of them are just like there to browse. Do you think this is a question from Eric Schwarzman? Do you think? Uh, for browsers, it, it is more like a B two C kind of strategy or a thing. Or for search, is it more like a B two B kind of strategy? Would there be any differentiation, or or do you think it it's just like like an audience behavior rather than a B two C or a B two B? I think it's an audience behavior. I think it's really hard to define one as B two C and the other as B two B because of the fact that the YouTube algorithm is personalized, right? So it's dependent on your previous um, history of things that you've watched, that you've shown an interest in. So my YouTube homepage will be different to Nikki's, will be different to Bengi's, will be different to everybody's. So depending on what I've searched in the past, YouTube might actually leverage things to show me in the homepage. So it's really hard to say that that's a B2C approach. Um, because lots, yeah, so I, don't, I wouldn't classify it as B2C or B2B. I would classify it as more, if you are trying to appeal to the homepage, so the browsers, you really have to come up with content that's a lot more mainstream, that's a lot more um, kind of wider interest than what you might normally do for your brand. Um, whereas on the, the searchers, you can be really, really to the point, right? because people will search for very, very specific things. Um, you know, the how to series are a great example of, you know, how to do X, Y, Z. Um, and even though that video may not come up in the homepage because it's not really a mainstream piece of content, it will rank really high in the search side of things. So that's why we consider them two different buckets, but I would hesitate to label them as B2B or B2C. Perfect. And also uh, thinking of your hero hub and help uh, framework or structure for content. There is a question from James Nicholas. And uh, if we were to apply that to a food product or potentially a cooking uh, channel, I would assume, uh, would you be able to come up with some examples? Um, sure. How, how it may work? Absolutely. Um, so I worked with a couple of food channels as well when I was at YouTube. So I worked with the people like Jamie Oliver and Sorted Food, et cetera. So I've seen a lot of these guys employ a lot of this, a lot of these techniques. Um, so I'll mention a few. So, so it lets the hero is really easy, right? Um, because hero is really when you look at tentpole moments, because like I said, it's only between two to four videos a year. You're not going to do more than that really. So in the food world, there's very specific tentpoles. Um, since the U S audience is massive, right? A lot of food channels will do, turkey during Christmas and Thanksgiving. And you know, you only need one turkey roasting video and it will peak every single time during Christmas um, and New Year's and, um, and Thanksgiving. So that's a great example of a, a hero video on the cooking side. Um, I guess during the pandemic, a uh, hero one could be sourdough starters and <laughs> sourdough bread. I don't know if you saw the YouTube insights that was released recently. There's a massive increase. And I am I am also one of those people that have tried their hand with the sourdough bread, uh, failed miserably, but then got it right at the end. Um, so that, that would have been a hero, for instance. So if you were a food channel and if you were not really doing anything around sourdough bread or home cooking, you kind of really missed a massive moment uh, mm. during, the, during, the, during the pandemic. Um, the hub stuff for a food channel is really, easy in my mind because it's really around recipes like it's what people will come to your channel again and again for um so if you manage to get people in with like a turkey roasting video or a sourdough video and then they see oh what else does this channel do um then the recipe videos could be a very easy way to sustain and if i were you i would really position them i would create different um formats like you know there might be people who want to cook you know cook that's 30 minutes or less. There might be people that want to do five ingredients or less. So you could create different kinds of, and that's a format, right? So you could do different kinds of formats and um, you could then uh, place these as shelves 
um, and you're essentially appealing to an audience, and that's a great hub version or example of a hub content. And the helps is I would base it completely around how to, right? Like how to dice an onion, how to you know, more like cooking cooking skills. Um, so yeah, I, in my mind, that's hopefully that's, those are good examples. I can't really see the response yet uh, in, in my view, but uh, hopefully that gives a good example of how Hero Hub help would would kind of employ in the food sector. No, that they are great examples, and I think the the other ten commandments that you were mentioned, they should be kind of like printed off a of a one sheeter and should be like the go to uh, one sheeter for everybody who has a YouTube channel. With that, I think it's time for us to kind of potentially um, understand a little bit of the background kind of magic of of the Body Coach TV. So maybe Yellen, I'll leave it up to you to ask some questions to Nikki, and I have one question for him, but I'm going to keep it up until the end. Okay. Um, maybe we start at the beginning, um, uh, Nikki. So motivated you. When I tried to get in touch with you guys, and I was like, "You need to have a YouTube channel." Um, what really motivated you to start the YouTube channel and continue to build on it despite everything else that you guys have been doing? And you've been very busy with lots of other initiatives. Yeah. So I think uh, you know it was uh, four or five years ago when um, we really started to think about new ways to engage people with fitness and food and you know the, the thing that we found was we had found real success with Instagram um, and I would always say that's kind of where the body coach brand was was born um, on yeah. Instagram with, with very short snappy 15 second um, video recipes that obviously went on to launch the lean in 15 brand um, and and became the, the you know success with the books and everything else but the thing that we found was that there was nowhere really for longer form video to live um that was doing the job that we needed it to and we, we you know we tried with facebook and different um platforms but really it was a um i think originally we were looking for somewhere for longer form video to live and that's where that's where it started i would say yeah and what was the intention behind um kind of focusing more on fitness on the YouTube side? Yeah, so this came with a bit of um, a bit of experimenting, really, because we did, you know, I, I always say that the Body Coach brand is sort of 50-50, food and fitness. Um, and we, you know, we had, we tried, we have experimented a lot over the, over the years to kind of get to where we are now. And we tried things that have, have failed and we've tried other things that have been really successful. But, you know, what we found was that YouTube for us really, it became a home for fitness because food was doing so well on Instagram and Facebook. And we just realized that um, the appetite for the fitness content was was just outperforming the food um, stuff. So it was really a case of trying stuff in the, in the early days, seeing what worked and really just finding that, you know, fitness um, became such a, it, it was performing much better on YouTube. Yeah. Yeah, and I remember when we were talking about this too, we we felt, and this is good good advice for anyone you know with multiple you know social media channels, which pretty much every brand has. Make sure that all of your um, destinations have unique content. Um, we would never, and Nikki, correct me if you don't agree, but I would never recommend that you post the same thing on multiple places because it kind of disincentivizes people to follow you on those different destinations. So this was also part of the reason why. Uh, because in, you know Joe Wicks' uh, Instagram page was so much uh, around food, we were also thinking that we would create a unique kind of selling point with the YouTube side of things by focusing more on the fitness side of his business. Um, and Nikki, I want to ask you, you know, one of the first meetings that we had um, with you and Joe, and I asked Joe, why? What do you want to do? What's your mission? So I want to ask that because um, it's really you know, at the beginning I talked about values. A lot of this stuff, you know, the purpose, the authenticity, the empathy, you can't generate this stuff. As in, it's either inherent to your brand and how you approach your content, or it's not. You can't really, you, you know, make it up. So I think if this has stayed true to you guys all these years, what is the Joe Wicks's, like, what is, yeah, what, what, what is your kind of core value that you build everything around? Yeah, so, you know, I know purpose is, is a term that does get used a lot. Um, 
uh, nowadays and it is something that we you know we've always had at the heart of um you know joe as an individual has always been very motivated to to help people get fitter and healthier and um as as a brand you know we've tried to make fitness accessible for everyone so it's not a, a tagline that we use externally but internally it's something we always talk about you know fitness for everyone um and you know social media has allowed us to you know youtube specifically with fitness has allowed us to create fitness content that is accessible to everybody so you know if you can't afford a gym membership or if you know for whatever reason you can't get to a gym or it, it, we, we we've, we've kind of at the heart of it is we want everybody to have access to fitness and we continue to this day to you know we always said with youtube because one of the things i would say is you know you do have to be patient i think can, you, you talked about consistency a lot and yeah. i would argue, i would argue that consistent youtube is the place where consistency matters the most out of all of our channels social channels because consistency has been really key on youtube but also patience um but we always said if one person does our one of our workouts um then it then it was worth filming that piece of content and putting it out and we've always stayed true to that you know even that you know we're, we're very fortunate our channel has grown and we from when we started and we met we've, we're now at two and a half million subscribers but we we always say if one person does the workout somewhere in the world it was worth it was worthwhile and so our purpose is to you know put content out that people can really use and we you know that's still at the heart of our decision making today really from when we when we started this you know four or five years ago yeah yeah that's that's great can i just like jump in because i i'm seeing i think it's like a, there's a consistent uh kind of like a, a question coming from the audience and it just ties in really well to what you've said that you've started and it takes longer time youtube is like a place where you need to commit and you need to have that consistency and you just don't give up it's like having a like really starting a startup really uh, most people are asking some of the examples and also generally it's always easier to speak when we have like um a name or a big celebrity or a big brand with a big budget when it comes to like uh when if you're a no name or if you're just starting really from scratch and if you don't necessarily have the the biggest budgets on the planet then what are the kind of like the like how would how do you see this working or where would you kind of recommend starting what would be the strategy to start uh, or are there any hacks or tips that you could share? Obviously, everybody starts from somewhere. And how do you see this applying to small to medium businesses in general? I mean, this is a question to, to both of you. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, I'll just share my, my thoughts on that. I mean, I, I think you touched on it there. But I mean, when we when we started, um, we, we certainly you know were much smaller um, brand and, and way and way less known. I mean, this is this has grown over time. But I think you know yeah yalin's points do apply to, to to everyone i mean i think consistency with youtube is key i think it'd be very easy to to make start making videos put them out and and get disheartened by um you know not getting many views or, or, or certainly you know organically if you're not spending any money um which um as a business we, we we've never spent any money on youtube it's always been um uh, you know or, or, or grown organically but um i think patience um and consistency really do nurture growth on youtube um it's not something that can happen overnight um but i, I do think that some of these some of these commandments and some of these things yeah has shared today have been uh, can be applied to any small brand um in, and actually in, in any sector I, I i always think um gary vaynerchuk is a good example of this i mean he he started making videos on youtube about um wine tasting wine uh, many years ago and he talks about this a lot that nobody was watching these videos like 20 30 views and you know he, he's now a, a huge name in, in in the marketing world but um when he started he just was relentless just kept on turning up kept on making those videos and we we were very much like that you know we, we were looking at our numbers and it wasn't always growing as fast as we would have liked but we just just keep on you know ha have have that patience and consistency because I, I do believe that goes a long way on youtube mm -hmm. i completely agree it's uh 
I think the production side of things is daunting, but like I mentioned, you don't really need that much equipment. The production side of it is actually the least, the thing that should worry you the most um, for a small, medium-sized business. I think the content and what you're going to actually record is, is key to kind of having a successful YouTube presence. And then, as Nikki said, continuing to do it. YouTube is a long game. It's not a short game. It's not meant for, um, you know, instant satisfaction, unlike some of the other social media places. And I would actually argue that YouTube is not a social media platform, it's a video platform, first and foremost. It's an entertainment destination that people come and watch more than an hour a day. Um, if you can believe that, so it's it's that's why we say content is king, um, and you are you are kind of up against you know more than four hundred and fifty hours of content uploaded every minute. So we've been talking about almost fifty minutes here. I can't do the math right now because I'm tired, but that's a lot of hours of content. So um, that's why the content that you make and the authenticity in it, the, the the purpose in it, and me having it true to your brand is so 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 important. Um, Always. It doesn't matter how big you are, how small you are. I think that's the crux of, of, of a really good YouTube presence, but it does take patience. Perfect. And just, sure. sorry, just to add to that, um, cause I know, you know, we touched on that budget and, you know, we, we, we still produce our YouTube content on, 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 on basically zero budget. I mean, obviously the cost of, you know, we have one camera, um, a tripod and a light and all of our content is still filmed and shot um in, in 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 real time so we keep our editing costs down i know this this can't apply for you know for all forms of content but i always you know you can produce content on a small budget um and in fact some of the higher produced content that we've experimented with over time has actually um not performed as well so um yeah i think it's 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 a very it's a miss uh, a misunderstanding to think that you need a lot of equipment and a big budget to make good content is a real dangerous place to to, to, to be because it, it isn't the case at all i think it also goes back to what you're saying is, is going back to the authenticity of 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 the platform like it really favors uh not like real content that comes like really raw and not necessarily super shiny and big production budget because it's it's real and people could relate to it uh, going back to like hub hero and help videos as a, also a kind of like a if as a starting point yellen do you think that there is that there should be a strategy or you need to, when you're starting first your your youtube channel you need to focus on xyz content or is it just a combination of of all these three things. And same question going back to you, Nikki, what are your hero hub and help videos in, in general? Um, maybe I can go first with the, sure. the first yeah, question. Yeah. So when you're first starting out, I wouldn't worry about the hero at all. Um, unless you have a brilliant idea that you can that you can tag on it's really hard to go when you as a new channel it's really hard to kind of create a hero moment um so if i were you as a new channel you're really trying to get discovered i would really focus on help but having said that for certain sectors hub and help are kind of intertwined and i'll give you an example because i don't want people to think of these as rigid boxes they're not really mm -hmm. rigid boxes they're different ways of thinking how you can approach content and kind of bucket them the main thing being know what to expect from your video so when you're making a help video don't expect it to get hero type viewership right like that's the main thing behind uh, the whole concept um, but i'll give you a very easy example which is in the beauty space for instance if you're a beauty brand the content that you will make, your hub content, will likely be your help content because most likely you're going to be doing how-tos, right? Like how to do certain types of makeup as a beauty brand. And that will be a help content just by definition of the fact that it's discoverable, it's searchable, it's search friendly, but it's also your hub content. That's what people expect from you. So don't think of these as very rigid buckets, but I would definitely focus more on as a, as a new starter is how can I get discovered? So being fully optimized in your titles, in your tags, uh, in how you package your content. So, because the titles, the tags, the custom thumbnails, they're the packaging of your quote unquote product, which is your content. So they all need to be really targeted and hopefully targeting search keywords. You can use uh, Google Trends to look at what keywords are trending and what are people searching for. Um, but that's what I would recommend you start with. And then I'll pass it on to Nikki. 
Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, we didn't start to think about hero content till for, for quite a while um, in our in our journey in, in, in the kind of um, way Yellen's described today. But w one thing that's um, that struck me is what I, whilst looking at that model um, is that I think you can also have hero content that, you know, doesn't necessarily live on YouTube, but can help you grow your YouTube. I mean, one of the things we've we've done, I think, quite successfully is leverage our other channels that may have been bigger um you know whether it's an email mailing list or a facebook page um to drive traffic to our youtube channel and to grow our youtube um presence so even now i think like something like 11 percent of our youtube views um are facebook referrals so that's through us you know sharing our youtube uh, content on facebook and you know and also we we do it on instagram and other places so i would say to to really you know if you're starting youtube but you have other um uh, you know platforms that you may be slightly bigger on use those to 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 to, to help people discover to content that's a great tip it's uh it's 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 what every creator does it's what every public figure does um it's a great way to use stories in other platforms or even uh kind of mini video posts and then link to YouTube to kind of promote, because especially if you have a following outside, definitely use that to create referral traffic uh, into YouTube, for sure. That's, that's great tip as well, definitely, I agree. And also, if I may add one last tip, I think like, again, it's kind of going back to what you've suggested, Nikki, if one of the best ways that what I've seen in terms of growing is like collaboration, and it doesn't have to be like, you don't have to collaborate with a channel that has millions of uh, or hundred thousands of subscribers you could start small and that's going to add up i'm not sure if you if you would like back me up on this one um, and uh, with that i just want to ask you where the audience could potentially find you after after this uh, this chat if you could uh, tell us where they could find you and maybe your last tips uh, just one one sentence tip sure um well, you guys can find if you, there's. I think there's a lot more questions that are coming yes. in that, and we can answer. So if there's any way I can help, you know, you can tweet me at uh, Filmic. I think the team will be posting that in the live live comments. You can reach out um, on um, on Twitter. I just see it there. Perfect. Or you can you can find me on LinkedIn under Yalan Solmas. Um, I think that link is also going to be provided. Um, happy to answer questions on those on those platforms. Um, the, my last my last kind of advice would be, even though I showed you guys lots of different models and approaches, like I said, don't think of these as rigid um, ways to approach your content. At the end of the day, everything that I've shared with you is things that we've learned from creators and brands on YouTube. We didn't write this book, right? The beauty of user-generated content platforms is the users generate the content and we learn from them. So please surprise me, surprise us, right? Let us add another commandment. Let us add another bucket of content. I don't know. Like, I think there's a lot more creativity than what, than what I've shared, but this, we just wanted to provide some sort of a framework so that it's not so daunting when you guys are sitting as a team saying, what are we going to create for YouTube? That you have some sort of a, okay, let's just follow the step-by-step -step process to get us there. But at some point, believe me, you won't be using any of these because it will be native to you. You will know how to approach it. I highly doubt that Nikki thinks about, you know, Hero Hub help and the commandments at this point because they've got it down. They understand. They have a neat understanding of the platform in their own way. So, that would be my last parting words. I would say. Thank you, Alan. Yeah, and look, you know, we are still learning all the time. Like we're learning every day. Like I, I don't think that for one minute we've cracked cracked YouTube or, or, or you know, content or it, I think it's always changing. Um, it's always evolving. But I, I, I actually would say that for me, YouTube is the most stable video platform um, there is. Um, I've, I, I, you know, Instagram is a huge platform for us, as is Facebook. But in terms of video and, and you know, longer form video, YouTube has been without doubt the most sort of stable um, place environment for us but my, my, my key tips I think I've touched on them but I would say you know um, experiment when you're starting out don't be scared to try things and you'll learn very quickly about what's working and what's not and you know when you start to see some uh, positive um, 
you know engagement then move more towards that go you know that will the, the numbers will tell you um what the audience is and and the algorithm and everything else is responding to um and yeah use use other chat cross pollinate your content cross promote it but i think the main thing is just is be patient and consistent because you know it took us five years to get to to you know to to, to eight hundred thousand subscribers and it that was every week posting a video every single week and it takes time um but it's it's a, there's a huge reward at the end of it i think if you can get past the those initial stages youtube is a, is a fantastic platform for i think for all businesses thank you so much it's it has been an absolute pleasure having both of you and they're like amazing tips uh, i've as you said it's a long journey i've been working in and out youtube for more than 10 years and i'm still learning that's what keeps me kind of having fun and going on so thank you so much uh, i really enjoyed this chat and um I'm sure everybody else did as well. The, the presentation is going to be, and this is uh, an event that's being recorded. It's going to be available on SEMrush forward slash webinars forward slash past, and it's going to be posted on their website. And in the meantime, if you have any other questions, you can raise it directly to Yalun and Nikki later on. Uh, thanks so much for your time. And I hope to reconnect with you at another event or sometime in the future. Perfect. Thanks for having us, Bengu. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Thank Enjoy you. the rest of the uh, of the seminar. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye, Bye guys. Bye. Bye. And now I am going to be joined by my lovely co-founder, Paolo Marinone.